Healthy, healthy. Hey there, and welcome to Healthy Schmelty, the fanciest, schmanciest public health podcast this side of the interwebs. I'm your man, Rishi B., and this episode is about the Trump Care Bill, which was first known as the American Health Care Act when it was in Congress, and now it's known as the Better Care Reconciliation Act as it currently awaits its fate and also last minute changes in Senate. Gotta say, Better Care Reconciliation Act is a better name than American Health Care Act, IMO as the kids say. Full disclosure before we get into it, I am a master's of public health and I work in the healthcare industry. And one time I saw under my sixth grade teacher's blouse when she was leaning forward, I could have turned away, but I didn't, you guys. I decided to dive headfirst into that blouse. Uh, whew, feels good to be open. Feels good to let loose. Uh, Before we get into the bill, a guy once said, uh, this guy, uh, he's an orange guy. You might know him as Trump. It's an unbelievably complex subject. Nobody knew that health care could be so complicated. And, you know, he took a lot of shit for that uh, when he said that. Uh, Well, he took a lot of shit from the 70 percent of America who's not, uh, you know, who's not part of the Trump cult. But um, (laughs) yeah. He took some flack for that, and but you know what? I gotta say that healthcare doesn't have to be all that complicated if you accept that uh, all American citizens should be covered. Because if you think that they do, then it really doesn't have to be all that complicated if you think that and you're drafting a healthcare bill. It only gets complicated when you don't think that all Americans should be, uh, should have health care insurance, meaning single payer, meaning most likely that uh, Americans would be paying that via taxes. Now, putting aside increase in taxes, uh, single payer uh, does have some benefits because everything that's being debated right now is due to the fact uh, that when you're drafting a health care bill that doesn't acknowledge that all Americans should have health care uh, just as just on the basis of being an American citizen, then what you have to do is figure out what to do with the people who aren't insured and are seeking health care coverage because a lot of times that's what we're all paying for who have health care insurance. Um, In one way or another, that payment for these people who come in, you know, those catastrophic surgeries and those uh, Grey's Anatomy episodes, uh, someone is paying for that. And so uh, if they had health care insurance just from being an American, we wouldn't have to worry about that. But because we have to worry about that, that's where all this complication comes from. And it's interesting, you know, back in the uh, back in the day. Let me take you back to November 2016. Can you all do that? You have no in plan. Educate. Oh, I do. Secretary, in fact, you I have, have no written... plan. In, in the news and stuff, things got very heated. And in America, everything was super politicized, very heated. Um, in my memory, uh, which isn't that long, uh, but in my memory, uh, you know, it's, it's the most heated uh, uh, presidential race that I can remember. And so much to, so much so that opinions were flying even at my workplace. One time, I was talking to someone, a, co- a colleague, and it turns out they were a Trump supporter. And uh, over over the weeks uh, before the election, and even actually after the election, we got to talking with each other, and actually we came to respect each other, uh, which was very interesting. Uh, It's very interesting talking to someone on the other side. Uh, They become less demonized. And uh, we were talking about uh, how healthcare should be. It was very surprising to me that he came to the conclusion that a single payer would actually be very helpful. And this is a Trump supporter. This is a uh, conservative guy. Pretty much he came to that conclusion because a lot of the work that we do, uh, he and I, uh, stems from the fact that uh, there's a lot of differences when you're dealing with different companies who are providing care. 
And so uh, we, as being healthcare industry workers, uh, we have to do work that acknowledges the differences in different companies. Being single payer, if everything was coming from the government, it would all be one uniform location that we would be dealing with. So that would make our jobs a uh, fuck of a lot easier. Please excuse my French. Okay, so let's talk about the Better Care Reconciliation Act as of Monday, 26, uh, 9 p.m. I tried to do as much research as I could before I recorded this podcast episode. Uh, So I'm trying to give everyone here uh, the most up-to-date info that I can. Okay, so let's talk about what the, uh, the Senate's Better Care Reconciliation Act does. So uh, first up, this was also in the American Health Care Act, the Congress's uh, Trump Care uh, version. Uh, Planned Parenthood will be withheld from receiving reimbursements for a year. Uh, so this just came in hot from the presses from the CBO. Uh, another impact of the Better Care Reconciliation Act is that it will reduce the deficit by $321 billion if it was uh, enacted today. So uh, just to put that in perspective, the CBO projects, also projects that the deficit, that America's deficit for this year will be $14.8 trillion. So if that projection of the $321 billion uh, reduction in deficit holds, then uh, Trump Care would make the deficit by the end of this year $14.5 trillion. Interesting keeping these numbers in, uh, in perspective. Uh, and man, talk about making three hundred twenty-one billion look small. Fourteen point eight trillion to fourteen point five trillion. Holy cow! If I had three hundred twenty-one billion dollars, you guys kidding me? I, I wouldn't be doing this podcast. I'd be paying. Uh, I'd be paying uh, my mom and dad to do the podcast for me. Anyways, another impact of the Better Care Reconciliation Act is instead of the mandate. Uh, people will be offered incentives to buy health care insurance through tax credits based on age and income. Now, if you don't purchase during the annual enrollment period, which typically uh, all around America is around October to November, you'll face a six-month lag penalty and also potentially up to 30% of a surcharge. Uh, just a little note about the credits that are being offered by the Better Care Reconciliation Act. They target younger, healthier people. So it'll be less of a benefit for you if you are older. So that's kind of what we know. It keeps a lot of the, uh, keeps some of the subsidy, uh, uh, sh- subsidy system that the Obamacare, a.k.a. the Affordable Care Act, uh, put into place. That'll stay in place for about two years. And just in general, uh, a lot of the policies of the ACA have been kind of shifted where they're guaranteed now. uh, Basically, they're going to be gradually taken off instead of immediately, which was what the uh, Congressional Trump Care Bill was proposing. So if we're talking about what the rest of the impacts of the bill are, well, it kind of depends. So first off, uh, and this is shouldn't come as a surprise to anyone who's been keeping track of this stuff, uh, it depends on if, if you have pre-existing conditions. So uh, just to keep things in mind, you know, where we're going and where we're going from, the Affordable Care Act said insurance companies can't deny or charge more for uh, the same plan. Now, the uh, Better Care Reconciliation Act keeps the denial mandate, so uh, insurance companies can't deny anyone, but it allows states flexibility as far as what coverage uh, people with pre-existing conditions get. You know, the impact regarding that will depend on what state. If you're a person with a pre-existing condition, it'll depend on what state you're buying health care from, and it will depend on the insurance company in reality. It will also depend, the impact of this bill will also depend on if you're a woman. So uh, states can opt out of having all plans require maternity care, so women could pay more for their plans. 
And also the tax credits and uh, subsidies and all that stuff that's uh, being offered to people to help pay for healthcare insurance, you can't use tax credits towards abortions. Healthcare bills only get complicated if you're not offering healthcare insurance to everyone, uh, meaning American citizens, because then the challenge is, is how do you get healthier people, healthy people to buy healthcare insurance? Because uh, we need healthy people to buy healthcare insurance to create a little cushion for these, uh, for these sickos, for the sick people. All you sick people, you're so sick. I mean that in the cool way, you guys. So uh, the impact of the Better Care Reconciliation Act will depend on how sick you are. You know, generally that's going to mean how elderly you are, because the more elderly you are, the more likely the sicker you are. It is, it's going to depend, once again, which state you're buying uh, health care insurance from, because states can opt, opt out of mental health coverage, for example, pre, uh, prescription coverage. So just once again, uh, you know, keeping in mind where we're changing things and what we're not keeping, what we're keeping. Uh, Currently, under the Affordable Care Act, all healthcare plans, regardless of where you are, what state you're in, blah, 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 all have to cover the minimum essential benefits, the 10 essential uh, minimum benefits. You can look that up to see what they are, but that does include mental health coverage and uh, certain prescription coverages. So, uh, you know, that's regardless of how sick or elderly you are. So that's why a lot of this kind of depends on where you are and um, which benefits insurance companies and states are uh, opting out of and that kind of thing. Uh, but you, you should note if you are elderly that the uh, Medicaid used to be available for you if Medicare. So if you were um, if you were in a, a long term inpatient stay, then after 100 days, uh, Medicare would cut out. So that's uh, how it works currently uh, under the Affordable Care Act. Uh, But then Medicaid would be available for you if you were uh, in patient stay longer than 100 days. This is the big thing that's being publicized now with the Trump Care bill that federal payments to states will decline. And uh, so that's uh, the reimbursements for Medicaid. So, you know, the states that opted out of certain things and if states, uh, if you're not one of the uh, some 30 states in the country that decided to expand Medicaid coverage under the Affordable Care Act laws, this Medicaid thing for the elderly will impact you uh, greater if you're elderly. Uh, one thing that's interesting to see is if basically if you're a young, you know, under 26 year old, uh, rich dude, man, dude man, then uh, you're feeling pretty good about this health care plan because, man, let me tell you, you're going to get some tax credits up the Wu-Tang Clan, the RZA, the Jizza, and the Inspected Deck. You're going to get you're going to get all the credits. Uh, but yeah, if you're rich, then, uh, you know, you're getting a lot of uh, uh, credits from this uh, bill. So under the Affordable Care Act, uh, the wealthy and corporations uh, and large employers, they had to pay higher taxes, uh, which was funding the Medicaid expansion. Uh, but under the uh, Trump Care Bill, uh, this bill, Better Care Reconciliation Act, uh, taxes on the wealthy and corporations slash large employers would be repealed. One little caveat here, uh, this includes medical device companies. So medical device companies were facing some uh, taxes and fees under the Affordable Care Act. So you would think that they would be happy that uh, that they no longer have to pay taxes. But there is a little caveat here that the CBO predicts that uh, approximately 22 million less people will have insurance as of 2024. And uh, it, but it for sure, the CBO predicts that 15 million less people will have insurance if the bill were enacted today, uh, next year. So less people who have health insurance means less people who are buying medical devices. So a little catch 22 there for the uh, medical device companies, large corporations. 
depending on the racket that they are in. If you're not rich, uh, once again, things are getting a little complicated, especially if you're poor. So if you're in the 31 states and also District of Columbia that expanded Medicaid, pretty much if you're in Arkansas, Illinois, Indiana, Michigan, Montana, New Hampshire, New Mexico, or Washington, um, you can expect drastic changes more quickly. The federal funding will phase out starting for Medicaid. will st- will phase out uh, starting around 2021 and will cut off completely at 2024. Uh, Tax credits, which were once available for those at uh, 400% of the poverty line, you will be at 350% of the poverty line. If you're there, then you will receive tax credits. Uh, Some of the changes revolving the tax credits for the poverty line will benefit approximately uh, 200, uh, excuse me, 2.6 million people. Um, however, they could still be, even if they've purchased a plan, there's a little caveat here as well. Caveats everywhere with this bill. But um, even if you're one of the extra 2.6 million people who benefit from the poverty line changes with this Better Care Reconciliation Act, which was a big change that Mitch McConnell uh, made for this bill after he faced some opposition from within his party. So even if you benefit from that in order to purchase a plan, you could still be unable to afford the premiums that are after you've purchased a plan. So uh, a little catch-22 there. And also, once again, which is the theme here, running theme with this bill, it depends on which state you live in and how they react to this bill if it were to be passed. Uh, today. If you're an adult under 65 due to changes in the subsidies, uh, the oldest under that range would pay up to five times more than the younger people, or approximately 16% of your income uh, before you can get any credits or subsidies. This was 9.5% under the Affordable Care Act. So uh, like I mentioned, if you're a dude man and you're under 26 and you're rich, I'm rich, biatch, uh -uh, then uh, you're feeling pretty, 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 pretty. You're feeling pretty, pretty. Uh, Also, if you're an HSA account holder, uh, then you're feeling pretty, pretty as well because HSA account holders will get boosted tax breaks and raised contribution limits. It allows HSA funds for non-prescription j- drugs. This is the Reconciliation Act. It allows funds for non-prescription drugs where currently it does not. However, drugs that help with chronic conditions are still will still be blocked off. That's a huge chunk of the prescription market that uh, still will be kept off the HSA account. But um, I think most account holders will be happy about the tax break and the contribution limit, uh, potentially, depending on what their health care state is. And prices are predicted to go up if the better care reconciliation were to be enacted today. You know, the, the wealthy and the HSA account holders and the dude mans, they're, they should be feeling pretty pretty. Um, but it's going to depend what state you live in, because if your state has opted out of certain coverages... Uh, for your plans, then, um, you know, you could be pretty pretty and you could be wealthy and you could be a dude man. But if you're sick, then all that goes down the pooper. Uh, So there's another public health podcast called Medscape. And they did an episode recently about what do doctors really think about the Affordable Care Act. Uh, But they mentioned that most of the doctors they talked to mentioned that the Affordable Care Act should be tweaked. And uh, they mentioned that patients have better follow up after trauma and catastrophe because of the Affordable Care Act. It's interesting to note that um, they all, a lot of doctors agree that Medicaid expansion has made things better for doctors overall because they can provide more follow-up. Outpatient care for mental health has greatly expanded and uh, improved speed of receiving care has expanded as well for uh, major things like strokes and cancer.
you know, uh, there's a lot of talk about this Medicaid. What is Medicaid covering? Who has Medicaid? Uh, this is an interesting little thing here. 20% of America, approximately, is on Medicaid. So that's a 74 million people. And currently, it covers about 33% of America's children, and it's covering 50% of all births. Medicaid also covers about 66% of nursing home residents, many of whom are middle class and spent all of their savings on care before uh, taking advantage of the eligibility for Medicaid. So this is just something to keep in mind because Medicaid cuts will increase premiums for people who buy independently. And, uh, you know, people who need long-term care for things like cancer and chronic conditions, um, you know, when insurance companies aren't footing the bill, uh, you know, Medicaid is sometimes the thing that comes saves the day. You know, better care for people uh, before they go into the ER and before they go into the hospital, uh, that's what keeps, that's what, that's, that is a factor that plays into keeping the rest of our premiums down. Okay, so that's the little spiel there about the Better Care Reconciliation Act. But where are they at, though? Where are they at today? As T.I. would say, where are they at, though? Where are they, they at, though? Where are they at, So uh, just my little two cents here for whatever it's worth. Um, I have to say the Better Care Reconciliation Act, you know, it's being kind of trumped up. Hey, hey, Trump. Uh, it's being trumped up as a as the Obamacare repeal. It's not really a repeal. Basically, it's just gradually getting rid of the Obamacare. Keeps in, so it got rid of the tax mandate because it's a fee that was forcing you to buy health care insurance. Uh, so the Senate got rid of that, but then then they put in this uh, coercion that you're going to have to pay a 30% surcharge and you might have to wait for six months. So you're not only now are you paying a fine, which were, which is what you were doing in the first place with the Affordable Care Act, you're paying a fine. So now not only are you paying a fine, you now have the penalty also of waiting six months before you get health care. So I don't know whose great idea that was. Currently, I believe there is a lag before um, your plan goes official if you buy health care insurance outside of the enrollment period. But it's not six months. I can guarantee you that. You know, if this is why you're supporting the Better Care Reconciliation Act, uh, you really should check yourself because really what this is doing is doing a couple quick fixes that, uh, you know, a lot of conservatives have been talking about that needs to be done. It's doing some of those things, but it's kicking the can of repealing uh, down the line basically to 2026, uh, 2024, 2026 when uh, Medicaid would completely go off, when all reimbursement would be uh, just nixed out. So that's when people would be forced to uh, come up with some replacement for health care, uh, some new system for health care. Basically, because of that, I, I kind of think that this bill is going to pass because if there's one thing I've learned about government, this is just, this is outside of Democrat and Republican. If there's one thing I've learned about big bureaucracies such as the government, they love kicking cans down the road uh, for later, uh, doing the doing minimal stuff that they can uh, to kick the can down the road. There's a lot of conservatives who are opposing this bill or not putting out their opinions on the bill. Um, so I imagine there's a lot of conservatives who have reservations about the bill. I applaud you people for putting your thinking caps on. You know, if you're going to put in a bill, you shouldn't just rush it and just do a couple quick band-aids because a lot of the principles of Obamacare is being kept in, but you're just uh, getting rid of uh, taxes, tax credits and subsidies so less people will have health insurance. So yeah, you're reducing the deficit, but you're also having less people. And what if all those people went to the ER? Uh, then you're increasing the deficit. Go figure. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, where Where is the bill at? According to a poll by the Kaiser Family Health uh, Foundation, 30% of America supports the bill. Uh, the GOP, just to keep in mind, the GOP needs 96% of its party to pass um, the, the bill in the Senate, whereas in the House, the GOP needed 91%. So some of the right, as mentioned, some of the right don't see the plan going uh, far enough. 
you know, just kind of going along the lines of what I was talking about, that uh, this isn't really repealing Obamacare. Uh, This is just basically kicking the can down the road. Uh, Conservative writer Phil Klein of the Washington Examiner, he said, the proposed legislation reads less like an Obamacare repeal bill and more like an Obamacare rescue package. So if you're a conservative person, uh, that is something to keep in mind. Uh, For the record, Rand Paul of Kentucky, Mike Lee of Utah, these are senators, by the way, so Senators Rand Paul of Kentucky, Mike Lee of Utah, Ted Cruz of Texas, Ron Johnson of Wisconsin, um, have all but came out and said that they are, um, they have strong reservations about voting for the bill uh, this week, which is what Mitch McConnell wants. Uh, Just, I saw a line that uh, Mitch McConnell most likely will Put this bill for a vote either tomorrow, Tuesday, uh, the 27th, or Wednesday, the 28th. Other senators who've expressed reservations are Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, Dean Heller, Rob Portman, and Shelley Moore. Uh, they've all voiced their reservations. Uh, John Kasich, Republican governor of Ohio. I have to applaud John Kasich here. Um, he's been he was one of the first people, uh, Republican people, to come out and say that, hey, man, uh, we got some problems with this bill. And he, he started this uh, with the American Health Care Act when it was in Congress. He said that he's not opposed uh, a Trump care bill. It's not that just because it's Trump care, he doesn't want to pass it. It's just this particular bill, uh, he has some strong reservations about it. And he also mentioned that some of these, and, and actually a lot of uh, people have commented about this, that the way that the bill was proposed in secret and all this kind of thing, you know, the way it was drafted and pretty much it was made public just like uh, like two, three days before it's going to be put to a vote. He thinks that that's pretty shady. And, he's, he, and he said the bill might do better if it went under some negotiation with Democrats. Go figure. Negotiating with minority. Some other governors have sided with John Kasich. Um, so Charlie Baker of Massachusetts, um, he mentioned that Massachusetts will lose uh, money because of this bill. Um, and a lot of governors and a lot of senators have cited weaknesses with this bill in uh, behavioral health issues and uh, a major topic that's around the Midwest, fighting the opioid epidemic. So that's uh, where the Better Care Reconciliation Trump Care Act is today. Uh, Thank you all very much for listening to my podcast. You know, if you're someone who's strongly opposed to the bill, I highly recommend reaching out to uh, the aforementioned senators, Rand Paul, Mike Lee, Ted Cruz, Ron Johnson, Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, Dean Heller, Rob Portman, and Shelley Moore. Uh, the GOP needs 96% of its party to pass. Um, so if you're someone who's strongly opposed to that, I recommend calling one of those senators and voicing your opinions to them. An interesting article, if you want more information, uh, 538, Nate Silver's website. Uh, I'll put this in my show notes, <clears throat> and I'll put all my notes that I built this episode off of all the articles and stuff where I got my information in the show notes. Uh, But quick little note here, Nate Silver from 538, he posted an interesting article about the odds of the Senate uh, bill passing. And uh, he put some things about what hurt and what help a bill passing. And uh, he goes from a very general uh, perspective. And it's kind of interesting, the little game that um, politics is when you're looking at this bill from a game perspective, as opposed to the health care of millions of people. But um, bump. Once again, thanks for listening. And uh, please review or rate on iTunes or subscribe on iTunes. Those are things that help me out a lot. Uh, thank you all very much for listening. Good day. Good night. Good afternoon to you, sir or madam.